Is it just me, or is it uh, speaking after lunch is incredibly difficult? Um, so if you start going to sleep, just um, snore quietly. Don't, don't disturb those people around you. Um, Jesus says, pray that you not come in winter, and there's another text that says, pray that you not speak after lunch. We've had a tremendous feast already today, and I'm very keen to hear our fourth speaker, Brett Landry, so I'll get on with uh, what I'm going to do. I'm grateful to Rob Goddard uh, and to the team here at Cloverdale for welcoming us and living out this unity across denominations. Thank you for you being here. This is absolutely wonderful. We've looked at the church essential for God's plan, essential for God's word, and my topic is the church essential for God's people, and I think we need to put that as a question. Is the church essential for God's people? Because there are an increasing number of people who say, no, the church is not essential for God's people. And we've already heard a little bit from the first two talks that it's not just, this is not just about the fact that the Canadian culture is increasingly lacking in self-identified Christians. But it's self-identified Christians, the people who Sam intriguingly calls trans Christians, who identify as Christians, but who say, I can live a, a full, complete and happy Christian life without ever going to church. In fact, it's better that way. I have no love for the church. I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. And I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but those of us who go to church regularly go two and a half times out of four in Canada. This is across all denominations. So you know the story of the pastor going to a pastor's meeting across denominations, and he comes in the door late and he says, listen, I'm sorry I'm late. We had bats in the ceiling and so we're trying to get rid of them. And the Roman Catholic says, listen, we'll just bring around all our incense and that will drive the bats away. And the Presbyterian says, no, no, don't do that. We'll set up three committees to look into it, investigate it, and to make a recommendation. And the Anglican says, no, no, we'll just baptize them and you'll never see them again. <laughs> or the story of the guy whose mum wakes him up on a Sunday morning and says, you need to go to church. And he says, I don't want to go. The people, the people don't like me. And she says, you love the people there. And he says, no, nobody's interested in me. And she says, you always go. And he says, I want to sleep in today. Give me one good reason to go. And she says, well, you are the senior pastor. <laughs> now, for those of us, for those who stay away from church, there is a spectrum of reasons. On the one extreme, there are those who've been genuinely hurt, wounded, even abused. And that needs dealing with. And there are those at the other extreme who are committed to a consumerist, individualistic lifestyle where the church might just be one resource in my spiritual journey, but don't ask me to be committed. And the big muddly middle between those, we're just too busy or we feel too guilty or there are too many hypocrites or I don't like the music or I... The community isn't very good, and besides, I can stay home and listen to Tim Keller free of charge. And what is it that's missing from all of these things? What, are, what do all these things come down to? And I think they come down solidly to this. It is a lack of love. Because without love, everything we do as Christians and as churches is hollow, is hopeless and even harmful. If you've been wounded by the church, it's a lack of love. If there's no community in the church, it's a lack of love. And if you're an individualistic consumer, that's a lack of love. So I want to open 1 Corinthians 13 with you. And if you have a Bible, if you would open it to page 1075, in your um, Bible, in your pew. Sorry, that's just us Anglicans. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
which I think very familiar is the key to the entire letter of Corinthians. And I, sh I should say this, it is not a wedding sermon. <laughs> Paul didn't have a, a hallmark moment. This is the apostle writing to a very difficult church which is doing transformation in reverse. Instead of seeking to transform themselves to be like Christ, they're transforming their church to be like Corinth. And we are swimming in waters here on the West Coast that we're deeply affected by. I feel in myself the pressure to consume. I have all sorts of attitudes that are individualistic and pluralistic. And I received a, an email two weeks ago that called me politically correct. And I wrote straight back and said, thank you. Nobody has ever said that to me before. Corinth was all about the external appearances. We have this wonderful archaeological trove of evidence. Boasting was very important to their way of life. The Christians in Corinth were very gifted and very proud and spiritually juvenile. They loved the razzle-dazzle and what would bring the numbers. They thought they had arrived and had no reason to grow and they paraded their gifts and abilities without any care for the other, and it was corroding and corrupting the community as a church. If you want one sentence, they were Christians, but they were selfish Christians. So from chapter 11, halfway through to the end of 14, the apostle asks the question, why do we gather as a church? What, you, what do you do when you come together as a church? And right in the middle of this section, right in the center, he puts this chapter on love, because it's love that puts our gifts and our community in their place. It's because of love that church is unmissable. Because we go to church to build up those who come, and the whole idea, says Paul, of asking the question, why should I go to church, or what am I going to get out of church, is wrong-headed. It's a sin against love. And it's very interesting, chapter 12 and chapter 14 are quite direct, Paul basically says to the Corinthians, grow up. He says, you want to see the Holy Spirit at work? It's not by being emotionally carried away. It's not by the expression of great gifts. It's in doing what you can to build other people up in their faith. It's seeking to find a way to encourage and, ex and strengthen and benefit and move those other people toward God. It means you don't go to church for what you get out of it. You go to church for the sake of others. And I think it's just beautiful to see how Paul deals with this in chapter 13. I think if I were Paul and I were writing chapter 13, I'd get out the big stick at this say. And I would say something like, you are absolutely hopeless. Corinthians, I don't, I don't even know why I bother, frankly. You're a permanent headache. You don't pay me enough. You're so self-preoccupied, snap out of it, grow up. Here are 10 reasons you should go to church. That's what I would do. But look at what the apostle does. He comes beside them in verse 1. He speaks in the first person. If I speak in the language and the tongues of men and angels. He doesn't scold them for their shocking pride, nor does he pretend everything's all right. He comes alongside them and he includes himself in this struggle to love. And there is not one of us here who can read this chapter without feeling just how far we've got to go. And I have found this an incredibly searching exercise to work in chapter 13 over the last few weeks. So very simply, the apostle makes three points in 1 Corinthians 13. And the first is that love is necessary, verses one to three. And it's, this is almost the opposite of what you think he's saying here. He says self-serving Christians and self-serving ministry are self-defeating. So listen, listen to what he says. Paul's describing himself and all of us. You could even say he's describing three different kinds of churches in verses 1 to 3. So verse 1, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So if you like, this is the charismatic church. 
So Paul had the gift of tongues, which was mighty impressive to the Corinthians. And even more impressive, he'd been to the third heaven where he had heard things said to him that humans are not allowed to know. He had the dazzle factor. And he knew the temptation to strut his stuff. But he says, without love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, which would have been deeply offensive to his original hearers because the noisy gong was used in pagan temples in Corinth. When the gong went, it was saying to the gods, wake up, bong, attend to us, bong, come and worship, bong. See what he's saying? Or in verse 2, now we're on more comfortable ground. This is more the reformed evangelical church. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And knowledge is a catchword at Corinth. They respected this above everything else. The only problem is that knowledge can puff you up with pride, blow you up like a balloon, whereas only love builds up. And you can use your knowledge without love, and when you do that, it's completely hollow, and it's no help. Or the third sort of church, or the, the third kind of Christian, this is the social justice church, verse 3. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This is a spectacular act of generosity and giving away all you have, selling all you have and giving it away, or even making the final sacrifice and being martyred. But Paul says it is possible to do those things without love, and if we do them without love, it's nothing but an empty gesture. Now stay with me just for a moment here. I want to make this point clearly. The apostle is not saying that tongues or knowledge or self-sacrifice are empty. He's describing the effect of exercising those things without love on himself. Look at it again. It's not tongues without love that's the noisy gong. But if I exercise tongues without love, I have become a noisy gong. If I exercise my gifts without love, it transforms me into something I never wanted to be. It's not the gift that's hollow, I become hollow. It diminishes me, it leaves its permanent effect on me. So without love, the highest and best noise that I can make will leave me empty and meaningless. And the opposite is also true. When we use our gifts with love, it not only helps those whom we're loving, but it makes me more of what God has meant me to be. It's the same which is true for prophecy and knowledge and faith. Without love, it's not knowledge is nothing. I am nothing. You see what he's saying? I love, therefore I am. Just as Mark was saying in his first talk, the very act of, of being a believer is part of belonging to the fellowship of the church. And as I actively engage in love, the Holy Spirit makes us into whole persons as we give away ourselves to others. I think it's remarkable. And it just means that Christian love is completely necessary, not just for others, but for us as well who exercise the love. All my Christian living and all my Christian serving is of no use to me unless I love. Because it's only Christian love that makes me more than myself. It enlarges me. It takes me out of myself to care for the other. You know, it's after being born anew that I learn to love through the love of Jesus Christ that then helps me to escape from the dungeon of my own ego. It's as we love, we become more alive. It's as we give ourselves to others, it doesn't matter how grumpy I'm feeling, that I, my Christian life takes substance and gets reality. It's an amazing point, isn't it? It's a bit different than, than I think what I had thought. So self-serving ministry and self-serving Christian life is self-defeating. 
And the Corinthians thought they were very superior because of the gifts that they had. They thought the gifts made them into somebodies. It's not true. It's only love that makes you into a somebody. So point one, love is necessary. Point two, love is personified. Verses four to seven. Personified is a fancy way of saying that Paul is treating love as though it's a person. And the reason he does this is because there is a person that lies behind this description of love, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. God is love, and this unique love only exists between persons. You remember we're asking the question, is the church essential for the people of God? So ten times in this chapter he uses this very unique Greek word for love, agape. And in the Greek culture, all the other words for love were about emotion or sex or ecstasy. This is different. Agape is not a human virtue that I can work up by trying hard. Agape is not a personality type. You know, that person, they're just very loving. It is a supernatural gift that comes from God when God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It is the power of heaven It is the power of the interlife between the Trinity. It is the power of the life of the future being poured into our hearts. And as God pours his love into our hearts, it draws us out to God and it draws us to each other and to the future and enables us to make deliberate choices and to take deliberate actions, seeking the best for others. And it's always, always, always costly. It's very different than um, what you get at Walmart. Um, Well, what you get at some Walmarts. You know, be nice because it's nice to be nice. I remember first time ever going into a Walmart, it was in the States, they had a welcoming team for me. I thought, this is like church, we should do this. But it's not about being warm-hearted and open. This love is sacrificing and thinking about what's best for the other. And the natural identification of the person is you can clearly see it in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And I just say, you know this, but this is very different than all our current cultural views of love. All our current views of love are so weak and self-serving. They're all about my feelings and how this is going to work for me. But none of our current views of love would have moved Jesus out of heaven None of them would have made him voluntarily leave the throne to be born as one of us, to be rejected and betrayed and abandoned and executed for us to bring us to glory. And these little verses, verses 4 to 7, are so well known, aren't they? You see them on refrigerator magnets or quoted in wedding cards. And there are 15 verbs, 15 action words, and every one of them describes Jesus, and every one of them describes what's rotten in Corinth. And if you want to know what Corinth is like, you just read the opposite. So if you look at verse 4, love is patient and kind. Well, Corinth is impatient and unkind. The Corinthians could not abide the limitations of weak members of the church. So in the communion gathering, they rushed for the best seats and the best food. They wouldn't wait for each other. But love waits patiently. The life in church at Corinth was a competition. Who had the best best knowledge? Who had the best gift of tongues? Who was the best preacher? I can do what I want, they say. All things are lawful. I'm never going to give a thought to how it affects others. And here is the thing about gathering in church. You can never learn this kind of patience. You can never learn this kind of kindness on your own or online or just with a select group of friends. We have to be exposed to those who are annoying, infuriating and irritating. You've got to be exposed to those people who light your fuse to see how long your fuse can burn for. We need to be part of a gathering so that we can be transformed. It's being engaged in the church that you learn how to have a long fuse and you begin to learn how irritating you are to others as well. We have a person at our church who came a few years ago who's bounced between a number of churches in Vancouver. 
This person is an absolute, they've made a, they've got a PhD in complaining. And uh, they are not an easy person to be with. Nothing everyone does is right around them. They keep trying to find fault. And four years ago, two people in the congregation decided to bring this person into their group and work with them and love them and love them and love them. And for the first year, it was miserable. And for the second year, it was miserable. And for the third year, it was half miserable. Well, this year, it's a different person. Uh, this year, this person has a smile on their face. And last Sunday, they teased me. They teased me. I mean, I just, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. That's love. That's the effect of love. Do you know, Lebanon has welcomed something like one million Muslim refugees from Syria. And evangelical churches in Lebanon made the decision together that they would welcome these Muslim refugees into their homes to feed them and to supply them with whatever they could. My brother-in-law works in a ministry that, has, that takes him to Lebanon. And he said, when you go to these evangelical churches on Sunday that used to have between 50 and 80, 80 people, they now have between 500 and 800 people, 420 of them who are Muslims. And they say, we do not yet understand what you believe, but you have loved us and you've taken us in and we want to know, we want to understand why you believe what you believe. There's a lovely illustration of this patience and kindness in the book of Acts with the Philippian jailer. Remember Paul and Silas were illegally beaten for preaching the gospel? And they've been thrown in stocks in the deepest, darkest dungeon and they're singing, which... Ah, it's amazing to me. Maybe they were entertaining the other prisoners in the dark, I don't know. And an earthquake happens and the doors fly open and the chains fell off. And when the jailer sees that he's about to do himself in and Paul cries out, don't do it, we're all here. Now, how did Paul and Silas decide to stay? How did they convince the other prisoners to stay? It's, it's just an act of kindness because they knew he'd be executed if they escaped. And what's the first thing the jailer does after he prays to receive Christ? Before he's baptized, he washes their wounds in an act of kindness. It's like this kindness can be contagious. And if you track through these 15 verbs in this passage, you can tell stories like that for all of them. And all of them have to do with Jesus. Let me give you just two quick illustrations. Right in the middle of the list, we read that love does not insist on its own way. Love doesn't seek its own advantage. Love does what is best for the other so that they might be saved forever. Now, this is Pride Month in Vancouver, and the messages of Pride Month are be who you are. Be your authentic self, follow your heart. And the opposite of, the, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference to others. And what lies behind indifference to others is pride. And we're in a city that loves pride. And the apostle says, no, no, esteem others better than yourselves. This is agape love. It's different than eros love. Eros love is about seeking your own satisfaction it's about gratifying your desires and taking possession of the other for your own sake. Eros love is fundamentally acquisitive. Agape is the opposite. It's giving, not for my gratification, but for the good of others. Incidentally, that's why the symbol for Eros is Cupid. And you remember Cupid has a bow and arrow? And Cupid has a bow and arrow because Cupid is a hunter. And he's hunting for self-gratification, a clever and cunning hunter. But the symbol for agape is not a bow and arrow. It's the cross, where Jesus is skewered, giving himself to the end, seeking and winning our salvation. Or how about love not being resentful, as the old version said, love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't keep an account of the times you've been hurt or slighted or insulted. It just doesn't keep the score. 
It doesn't have a filing cabinet in your heart with grievances. You know that filing cabinet that makes you feel better about yourself? Or tells you the moment to get revenge? Or helps you protect yourself? Love doesn't do that. And Jesus perfectly fulfills this because in the cross, God does not reckon our sins against us, but reckons them against Christ. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the love of God that is the heart of, at the heart of the gospel. And the source of love and the pattern and power of the love is Jesus himself. So point one, love is personified. Sorry, love is necessary. Point two, love is personified. And third point, love is eternal. Just pause at this point. Is everyone with me so far? Does anyone want to lie down? Is anyone asleep? Anyone want to be? Thank you. Point three, love is eternal, verses 8 to 13. Now, mostly, uh, you know this little section. It's mostly read as those spiritual gifts are for this age, but love lasts forever, so we should focus on the gifts. But that's not the point of it. It's much more radical than that. Do you remember on the panel we said that the only thing that will free you to be self-sacrificial in your love is you ha if you have an eternal hope? That's what Paul's talking about here. 1 Corinthians is to selfish Christians, and they are in very real danger of losing their eternal reward. And all the things they value so highly are all focused in this world, and that's why they're spiritually infantile. In fact, in chapter 4, Paul says, you think you've arrived. Already you're kings. Already you're ruling. And it's why in, the, in chapter 15, we have the longest passage in the New Testament on the reality and centrality of the resurrection. But all the outward gifts they have are not the sign of spiritual maturity or even spiritual reality. That's love. And so what Paul does is he pulls the rag out, rug out from underneath their arrogance and their lack of concern for others, and he shows the eternal necessity of the church for the people of God. Just look down at it with me. In verse 8, begins with love never ends. Love never collapses. It never falls apart. And it finishes in verse 13. Faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And that means that love makes up the life of heaven. So that as we seek to love others in the power of the Holy Spirit, we experience something of the life of heaven now. I mean, just look at verse 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Everything we know about God, everything we love about God now is indirect. We look at him through the mirror. But then we will see him face to face, immediately, clearly, and fully. Our knowledge now is partial, it is limited, but when we see him, we will know him in a different way. There are two words for knowing in Greek. One is knowing things, objects, language, things that you can study. The other, knowledge, the other word is a much more intense word, and it's used for relationships with people, knowing the person. Not knowing about, but knowing the person. And in glory, we will know the Lord in the way that he knows us. Not that we'll know everything, but the way of our knowing will be different. Our knowing will no longer be based on fear and insecurity and ego and self-protectiveness but it will be based on who he is himself, transparent, at depth. It's the knowing of love. And if face-to-face -face is where we're going, it seems to me that's the ab absolutely indispensable mark of what it means to be a Christian and why church is indispensable for the people of God. It's in face-to-face -face where there's a different kind of knowing and relating. This is how we learn to love. This is how God transforms us now. This is the life of heaven in our congregations even now. It's the only thing that's going to last for eternity. If anything's going to be lasting for eternity, it's got to be built on Jesus Christ and it's got to be, it's got to be done in love. And when we do those things, people are drawn to Jesus Christ. 
And I think this is the furthest thing from moralizing. You see verse 11? When I was a child, I did childish things. I lived, like, I lived a childish life. Now, I said jokingly on my CV that I have two perfect grandchildren. Um, well, no one had to teach them how to be selfish. Uh, getting them to share things is like pulling, treat, pulling teeth. And trying to negotiate them at bedtime, well, it's just impossible. And we love them because when you're a child, you just don't think outside your own selfish skin, do you? And you're self-seeking and you're self-interested. And if you show chocolate, that's the end of the evening. I mean, <laughs> and though it's adorable in our grandchildren, it's excruciating in adult Christians who are impatient and unkind and envious and boastful and self-absorbed and self-preoccupied and just a burden to everyone else. And Paul says, when I became a man, I gave up those things. I gave up self-preoccupation. Because the way to grow as a believer is in community. And the true and authentic mark of Christian experience are not the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So love is necessary. Love is the person of Christ. And love is eternal. Church is necessary for the people of God. Let me make three points of application. Number one, the church is a laboratory for love. I think this is one of the reasons why there's no knockdown text in the New Testament saying you must go to church. You know, the writer, the closest we get is the Hebrews 10 verse. But there's no list somewhere that says here are the 10 reasons and you must go to church 49 times a year. No, no, God has made us for himself and for each other. And when the Holy Spirit takes possession of us, he spreads the love of God in our hearts. And the mark that Jesus is our Lord and God is my Father and my walking by the Spirit is that my questions change. So I'm no longer asking, do I have to, why do I have to go to church? My questions are more like, Today, how can I encourage and strengthen the others that I'm going to meet with? Who can I pray for en route to church? Um, who do I know, not know yet who I could welcome and speak to? Who's that sitting on their own? Uh, what can I say that would actually build someone up in their faith and encourage them? What can I do where things are weak and to strengthen? What can I do for others? And that's because the church has been designed by God to be a laboratory of love. And secondly, I think love is a labor. And as, we, as I've gone through 1 Corinthians 13 this week, I found it very challenging. And there have been two specific instances where I've had to change what I was intending to do because of what God was saying to me through 1 Corinthians 13. And I think if you're struggling with this, I reckon once a year you ought to go through 1 Corinthians 13 and just say, David, are you patient? Are you kind? Just go through it and ask God to give you help with that and repent for the places where you're not and where you're asking the wrong questions. Love is a labor. And thirdly and finally, I just want to mention the Lord of love. I can't leave the platform without mentioning the cross. <laughs> How do I know God loves me now? Where does this love come from? It comes from the love of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed that little verse, Romans 5 verse 8? Uh, God shows his love for us, for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Past tense, present tense. While we were sinners, Christ died for us in the past. When does God, God, when does God show his love for us? It's in the present tense. So how do I know God loves me now? It's as I go back and look at the love of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. How do I have a greater sense of the love of God for me to press in on my heart? It's as I go back and consider the cross again and again and again, meditate on his love, cling to the Lord Jesus Christ, abide in him. And the promise is that his love will permeate and change and show. So let's pray together. 
we bow together today before the Heavenly Father, asking that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant us to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that being rooted and grounded in love, we may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.